thank you for reading those scriptures. If you want the full version of that, it's like 30-some verses, and we weren't going to squeeze it all in, so we edited a little bit this morning, but I invite you again, turn in your scriptures to read these words of Jesus as he teaches about the kingdom of God and what it looks like as he shares with us his manifesto for what the life of the people of God is to be like. This last week we talked about the ways of the kingdom, what it looks like uh, to have the character and nature of someone who is part of this kingdom of God. And this morning, we're turning to the second section of Jesus' manifesto in which he talks about the laws of the kingdom of God. What it looks like to follow God's will for our lives, our moral and ethical behavior within the kingdom. So let's recap just a, for a moment what a manifesto is. If you recall, in short, a manifesto is a statement that declares the intentions, the motives, and the views of its author. It's someone saying, this is the way things ought to be, and this is the way things will be in my world view. We know that there are many manifestos out there and many worldviews. But for those who follow Jesus of Nazareth, there is only one manifesto that we pay close attention to. And that is the manifesto of Jesus himself. This sermon that he gives in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 in which he lays out the framework for what the kingdom of God is like. A question that we as believers need to ask ourselves about this manifesto of Jesus is how we will engage it. How will we think about it? Is the church that we are a part of, not Fort Gary, but the broader church, those who call Jesus Lord, is this an actual manifestation of a manifesto? Is this an outworking of this way of being and living in the world? In other words, is the Jesus manifesto, the kingdom of God, established and enacted and already present in the world and we are a part of it, an inbreaking sign of the coming of the fullness of Jesus' reign over all creation? Or... Or is it simply a description of will, what will be one day? What might come? The not yet kingdom of God. The way in which we answer that question for ourselves determines how we hear these words of Jesus and how we apply them in our lives. If we understand the kingdom of God to already be established and enacted in this world and that we are a part of it, then we will live into and take to heart what Jesus tells us. If we think it's only something that will be fulfilled sometime far off in the future, then we will consider the words and we'll consider their value and we'll think about whether we can, what we can or can't do, what's practical or not, and apply what we can and not worry about the rest because that's for another time. I would suggest to you that the kingdom of God is already here. That Jesus is enthroned in his kingdom when he is nailed to the cross. That his kingdom comes in fullness and breaks into this world in the power of the resurrection, which we will celebrate in just a few months from now. And if that is the case, then the words that Jesus speaks to us in declaring his vision for the world and the people of God, the children of God in the world, then we will take it to heart and we will live it each and every day. I'm going to be nostalgic just for a moment. As a young teen, 
I, in my home where I grew up, uh, we had a problem, which I think is common to pretty much every other home that I know of, at least where there are parents who are trying to enforce things. And that was that as soon as I heard the theme song from MASH on the television, I had to go to bed. <laughs> Any other Gen Xers like me have that experience? Or maybe you had lenient parents and you didn't have to go to bed when MASH came on, but when Knowlton Nash and the CBC National News came on, but it was definitely bedtime. You remember that? Some of you are just shaking your heads. You have the words that came out of my mouth mean nothing to you. <laughs> but we've all had a bedtime, right? Do you remember that time in your life when your, your, your parents had, look, the clock says it's this time. That's your bedtime. Go to bed. You have to go to bed. You have to go to bed at a decent time so that you can function tomorrow and I don't have to deal with you being a terrible child. Oh, wait. I don't think I was supposed to say that part. Okay. <laughs> but do you remember bedtimes? Now, as an adult, I look at my children and I go, would you just go to bed already? I want to sleep. I, I just, I just want to go into my room and close the door and turn off the light. I am tired. And if I don't go to bed now, tomorrow is going to be terrible. I don't need someone saying to me, Carl, it's your bedtime. I know it's my bedtime. Or I'm going to be cranky. Right? This is a little bit of a silly picture of what's going on in this part of the text that we read today from Matthew chapter 5. As Jesus explains the laws of the kingdom of God and how we apply them in our lives, how the, the laws of the Old Testament relate to the law of Christ in our lives. Sometimes when we think and talk about Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, I keep moving away. The camera's going to have a problem with that. I, I just can't help myself. We have, this, we have this picture of Jesus who is the kind and gentle teacher who comes to us with grace and forgiveness and rest. And that is good and that is true. But one of the mistakes that we make is that we think that this kind and gentle and loving and forgiving Jesus doesn't care about the laws of God. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. I'll forgive you. You're fine. Mercy, grace, forgiveness. But the mistake that we have made in that leap in logic is because we haven't understood the teaching of Jesus around the laws of God. Jesus is actually reinterpreting the law relating to moral and ethical conduct for those who call themselves or are called the children of God. He's reinterpreting by pointing to the intent of the law rather than to the letter of the law. And it actually results in this text, in Matthew chapter 5, it actually results in his teaching of a much stricter interpretation of the law rather than doing away with it and saying, don't worry about the law. Some of you are shaking your head right now. Some of you are feeling a little bit of anxiety creeping up in you because you've been, well, does that mean that I actually need to have those Ten Commandments memorized and do those things? Well, yes, but not in the way that you may imagine. Let's look again at Matthew 5, 18 and what Jesus says there. He says in this manifesto, he says, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law 
until all is accomplished. Now, you may understand what it means that not one letter of the law is abolished, but not one stroke of a letter. Well, the thing, the thing is that the Old Testament law was written in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, if you miss a, a dot or you miss an apostrophe or you miss a line, you change the word and the meaning completely. It makes a big deal. It's, it's a big deal when you miss a stroke of a letter. What Jesus is saying about the laws of God is wrapped up in that last phrase of this verse. The law will not be abolished until all is accomplished. What was the law supposed to accomplish? The Old Testament law. We learn in the book of James chapter 2 verse 10 and in Galatians chapter 5 that even to break one of the laws is to be guilty of all of them. It's not like these are important laws, those are unimportant laws, these are this part you should pay attention to, that part that's optional. It says that in the scriptures if we break one part of the law we have broken the whole law and are guilty of all of it. So what was the law supposed to accomplish? Well, there are a number of things. I just want to focus on two this morning. The first function of the law that was given to the people of Israel for all of humanity was to show who God is and to reveal God's holy character and God's perfect righteousness and desire for humanity's righteousness. The law reveals God and God's desires for us. The second function of the law was to reveal sinfulness and to show us just how far we are from what God has desired for us. Now, if that's the function of the law, What is the law supposed to accomplish? Well, the the law can't actually reconcile you to God. The law functions to show us our need for God. Our need for reconciliation. And we find the fulfillment of the law when Jesus says all is accomplished. We find that in Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, where Paul writes to the church and says this about Jesus. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, God revealing his character and nature, the first function of the law. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What Jesus is pointing to here when he says until all is accomplished is that he has in mind what God is up to as he comes to be with us to reveal God's character, God's desire for us, our need for God because of the sin and brokenness and to reconcile us and to draw us all into relationship as we repent and are renewed by the power of God in our lives, forgiven through the blood of Jesus. Because of that, because of what is accomplished through Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus can now point to the meaning of the laws of the Old Testament and say, it's not what you thought it was, there's something behind it. And so we look at the laws that were given. Jesus has this series of things in which he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. 
He says, you've heard it said, don't murder. Is the law about murdering or not murdering? How much, how close can I get to murdering somebody before it becomes bad? Well, you know, if they're within what we call an inch of his life, is that okay? No, that's not what the law is saying at all. Jesus says the point of the law is not about killing or not killing. By the way, I, just as an aside, in Genesis chapter 3, we have the fall of humanity. Adam and Eve sin by turning their backs from what God has said to them. What is the first recorded sin in the Bible after Genesis 3? Genesis 4. In Genesis 4, you find the story of Cain and Abel, in which Cain murders his brother Abel. But that is not the sin. The murder is not the sin that Genesis 4 is talking about. What preceded the murder of Abel in Genesis 4? It says, Cain became angry. And out of that anger came murder. And so Jesus, when he says, you've heard it said, do not murder, he reinterprets, he says, what we're getting at here, what the law is about, is about the anger that we have. And what we do with that anger So in the kingdom of God way of thinking, I don't need to say to you, don't murder people. Because, why? Because we understand that it's not about the murder itself, it's about the anger and what we do with that anger and how that anger destroys our lives and the lives of those around us. So if we understand that it's about anger, we don't have to talk about murder. And so it goes on. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. And he says, it's not about cheating on a spouse. It's not about that. It's about lust. It's about a condition of the heart. He says, in, when you divorce, you need to write a certificate of divorce. And Jesus goes on to say, no, Moses only let you do that because your hearts were hard and you, you were treating this this beautiful and sacred covenant that you have with this bond with your spouse, you were treating it like nothing. And so Moses put brackets around it and said, at least you have to do it in the proper way. Jesus says, a marriage is something instituted by God in which there's a sacred bond and we are not to break it. It's not about that. He says, you are not to break your oath, it's been said. But I say, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. In the law, it says, don't swear by the name of God and then not do what you said you were going to do. Why is that? Because when you swear an oath in the name of God and then don't do it, what are you saying about the God that you swore by? You are disrespecting and saying, I don't believe that this God's name is worth anything. Jesus says, it's better off. Don't even, don't even swear by something. Just do what you say you're going to do and you won't even get into that mess. Don't even come close to disrespecting the holy name of God. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, turn the other cheek. And it goes on with a couple more examples of what's going on there. Is this about eyes and teeth? No, not really. Jesus is saying that the intent of the law is about what justice in the kingdom of God actually looks like. In the Old Testament law, the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was about limiting revenge. It's about limiting the vengeance that people take on others. 
And Jesus is saying that in the kingdom of God, as I am teaching you, to respond in kind to an injustice done to you is to perpetuate injustice. If it's evil that you did this to me, why would I repeat that evil by doing it back to you? That is not the kingdom way. In human justice, this taking of vengeance in an equal manner, both then suffer, both are broken. There's a famous saying that some attribute to Gandhi that says, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. There are those who say it wasn't Gandhi, though. It was actually a Canadian, believe it or not. George Graham, who spoke in a, in a parliamentary speech talking about how if we take eyes for eyes and teeth for teeth, we'll be blind and toothless in the end. The law of God saying through Jesus, it's not an eye for an eye, it's turn the other cheek. It's walk the extra mile. It's give not only your cloak, but your shirt as well. Is about recognizing that in the kingdom of God, it is divine justice which ultimately is at stake. Rather than getting even, it's about being vindicated. About redemption, about reconciliation and restoration. I read an interesting quote as I was doing some research for this in which there is a, uh, I think it's Khalil Gibran who is a, a poet, a famous Sufi poet who talks about how can, how can you introduce a new idea to someone whose head you have taken off? How can you introduce a new heart to someone whom you've stabbed in the heart? You cannot. If we believe that the kingdom of God and God's divine justice is what it says it is, then we relinquish our control of what justice must look like. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus is saying that the Old Testament law is only about helping us understand that we are actually all neighbors, even our enemies. And we have one of Jesus' famous stories and teachings in the parable of the Good Samaritan in which he is answering the question brought to him, who is my neighbor? The teachings of the laws of Christ say, all are my neighbor. It goes all the way back to the covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where he says, through this covenant, all people on earth will be blessed through you. There's an interesting explanation here that Jesus gives about this idea of loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute you. He says in verse 45, do this so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Why? Because this is the way that God is. God makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. God's character doesn't change depending on whom he's dealing with. God is the same for me as he is for you, as he is for the, one, the person down the street who makes my life difficult, as is for the person who is trying to persecute me or ruin my life. God's character and actions towards them are the same for them as they are for me. Do we need a reminder? John 3.16, a verse that so many of us have, have memorized 
and taken to heart for our own salvation. But it's not about my salvation. It's about the world. God loved the world. He so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that who? So that those who really want God could believe in him. No, it says that whoever, whoever believes in him will not perish. God wants all to know that life. He wants all to be reconciled, as we read in Colossians. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the apostle writes to the church, encouraging them about this promise. He says, The Lord is not slow about his promise for justice, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, with all of you, the good and the not so good, the righteous and the not so righteous, the the friend and the enemy, is patient with all of you, not wanting any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He goes on, Jesus goes on in verse 46 to say, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? What more are you doing than others? Don't Gentiles even do that? If you are a kingdom citizen, if you live in the manifesto of Jesus, ought it not to look different in our lives than in the lives of those around us? How do our lives align with these teachings, the law of Christ, the character of a righteous God? Do people see the ways of Christ written in our character? Do they see the laws of Christ in our every action and motive and response to the daily circumstances of our life? We are left with this in verse 48. Jesus says, as when it comes to the moral character and ethics of the kingdom of God, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Perfect? Now, I will grant you that the word perfect has different meanings, and over time we're talking about uh, something that was written a long time ago, and perfect has had some shifts in meaning. We kind of think of it as a precision kind of thing. But in its context and in the way that it's used here in this teaching, it's about wholeness, being right, being righteous. Jesus is calling to us, be righteous like God is righteous. Live in the way of the kingdom. Walk in the laws of the kingdom and have them written on your hearts no matter what comes. For we are a kingdom people, and Jesus is our Lord. May that be our constant desire. And where we fail, and we will, and in our weakness, because we are weak, we will be made perfect in the righteousness of Christ through his blood and his resurrection. Amen.